Hello and welcome to Revelation class. We are studying through chapter 13. We started last week and uh, we completed the first section of this chapter. This chapter is divided into two sections. The first section is uh, the beast coming out of the sea. And uh, the second section is the beast coming out of the earth. So last week we studied a lot about Islam and how it uh, connects to a lot of things that were mentioned in the Bible. I'm not going to repeat all of them and uh, please go and watch part one if you have not already uh, watched that um, to get a better context in what we are studying tonight. So please watch part one before you watch part two. So tonight our job is to study the second beast. Okay, the seven sealed scroll judgments. So we have been uh, studying through the seal judgments, the trumpet judgments, the bowl judgments. So as I mentioned earlier in the previous sessions, the judgments started in chapter 6 and it will continue all the way through chapter 16. But in between the judgments, in between the 6th and the 7th judgment and in between 6th and 7th trumpet and bowl judgments, there are some additional material we call parenthetical material added. Now we completed trumpet 7, but then we were given some other material um, before we continue to the bowl judgment. We can better understand this with this chart, the 7 sealed scroll. So as I mentioned earlier, we cannot exactly draw a timeline, okay, so the seventh seal is opened and now comes the seventh tr seven trumpets. We cannot just draw a line because a lot of things go in parallel. So the, when the seventh seal is opened, now you have the seven trumpets going and now you have this parenthetical material. Some of them are just describing the characters, so some of them are just fits into back into the seals or back into the trumpets. So the, now what we are studying is the, uh, about the two beasts, the beast coming out of the sea and the beast coming out of the earth. So if we ask about the timeline, this is not a timeline thing. It is just a description about the two beasts that we are talking about. So keep that in mind. So we are uh, yet to study the seven balls. And uh, when I get to there, I will explain in more detail. So in chapter 12, we studied the woman, the woman, the pregnant woman, and the dragon and the child. Um, uh, we identified the dragon as Satan, and the child as Jesus Christ, and the pregnant woman as the nation Israel. I'm not going to repeat those details again, so please watch session 21. And then when we get to the next chapter, chapter 13, we studied the beast that's coming out of the sea. And sea always represents nations, people, languages, and tongues. So this beast is coming out of the Gentile world. That's what I mean. So please watch session uh, 22. And tonight we are going to study the second part of chapter 13. So last week I uh, alluded to the 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel. We need to have this understanding before we understand the book of Revelation. So I explained this in the previous sessions as well. So 69 weeks, Messiah cut off, Jesus crucified. And then there was a pause in the timeline that was given to Daniel. Remember, Daniel was given a 70 weeks timeline. 69 weeks pa passed and then Jesus was crucified and there is a pause now and we are in that pause, the church age. Once the church is raptured, now the timeline, the clock starts ticking again and again for the Jewish people. So that is why it is very important for us to understand the book of Daniel alongside with the book of Revelation. So the 70th week goes hand in hand with the book of Revelation. And this is for the Jewish people because the church is already raptured. So with that said, I also mentioned about the Holy Trinity. When we all know the God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit, the Holy Trinity. I also mentioned last week about the unholy trinity, the dragon, uh, which was introduced in chapter 12, Satan, uh, the beast from the sea. Last week we studied about the beast from the sea coming out of the Gentile world uh, and also it is a system, not just also a person. So uh, chapter 13, part 1 introduced, Satan is going to counterfeit everything. So even having an unholy trinity. So here, in Revelation chapter 13 verse 1 we studied, Then I stood on the sand of the sea and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, 
having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. I'm not going to explain all this because it was inter- it was explained in the last session. Just for the context, I'm reading these verses before I go to the second part. So now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon that Satan gave him his power, his throne and great authority. How are we going to identify the beast? I talked about you know, the signatures. So when we study this passage and study the book of Revelation, we started looking at some signatures or some clues to identify the beast. And also I talked about the Roman world. When we talk about the Roman Empire, here you have the Eastern Empire and also the Western. So this is all Rome. You cannot just take only one side. Most of the time where people go wrong is when when they talk about the Roman Empire because Daniel chapter 9 talks about the uh, prince of the world that is the Antichrist coming out of the Roman Empire. So Daniel made it clear. So it's coming from the Roman Empire. But the point we need to understand is they have two legs, Western Empire and also the Eastern Empire. So even in the statue, remember in the Daniel's vision, it has two legs. It has two legs. Very interesting. When it comes to the Roman Empire, it has two legs. So that's the East and the West. So we need to uh, look at both the legs or the both the divisions before we make a call of where the Antichrist would be coming. And a lot of this Islamic connection, I did the research and I have it, the thesis and the dissertations. I don't have time to explain all those details, but here are the resources if you are interested. You can just go to Google and just type John Reddy Persecution. If you type John Reddy Persecution, you will, be, you will get these links um, where you can read all the details about why I connect this with the uh, Islamic uh, connections that was mentioned in the Bible. Now, here John says, Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. So how do you know he is an Antichrist? One of the signatures that we saw was he denies the Son. He denies the Father and the Son. And I explained in detail how Islam denies both the Father and the Son. And John calls it as Antichrist. In verse 23, whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son have Father also. Uh, you can read that in 1 John chapter 2, 22 and 23. And also uh, John makes it in chapter 4, in 1 John chapter 4 verse 1, and 1 to 3 it says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but to test the spirits. Sadly, these days, many Christians are not even testing the spirits. They, if they go to a church, they just blindly follow. And sometimes they are following the wrong spirits. So it's very dangerous. So even John says here, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this, you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And in verse 3, And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist. In Greek, it is Antichristos, as I mentioned earlier. So it is uh, uh, opposition to Christ and also it can be read as in place of Christ. That is exactly Antichrist is going to do. He is going to oppose and also he is going to replace himself as, uh, as a substitute for Jesus Christ. Which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. So John says he is already in the world. What is he saying is it is not Antichrist in the world. He is saying the spirit of Antichrist is already in the world who is denying the father and the son. But the person, there are two things, the spirit of Antichrist and the person Antichrist. So you are going to see... Got the person Antichrist in the tribulation, but the spirit of Antichrist is already in the world. We see that in various religions who deny Christ, uh, specifically Islam. Islam unequivocally uh, denies the father and the son. Quran, uh, Surah 4, verse uh, 171, and also Surah 1935, you can read those details. And also some other signatures we saw throwing dust on their heads. So this is this is a Middle Eastern culture. It's not to any of the Western states like you know US or UK. They don't do this. 
So we saw a lot of clues I'm not explaining. And again, we saw Pope John Paul kissing a Quran and the links to that. And also he was praying with the Islamic people in blue Istanbul mosque. So these are the signatures we saw last week. And with that said, so here are the seven heads. Based on the scriptures, what we looked at, the seven heads represents the seven mountains. It also represents the seven kingdoms. You can, do, you can read that in Revelation chapter 17, verse 9 to 11. So, uh, and also ten horns represents ten kings, Revelation 17, 12. Five have fallen. Interesting, he says uh, seven mountains and kingdoms, and then he says five have fallen. Remember, John is writing when he is in Rome or the, during the Roman Empire, and he says five kingdoms have fallen. In Revelation 17.10, the first one is Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece. For John, these five kingdoms have fallen. And he is in the sixth one, Rome, and he says one is. For John, this is the current one, and so he says one is. And then the Ottoman Empire that followed Rome, if you remember the history of the Ottoman Empire after Rome, the uh, Turks started occupying and the Caliphates and the Ottoman Empire, they grew. And uh, he says, and the other has yet to come. For John, the Ottoman Empire is not in the view. And he says, one yet to come. That is the seventh Ottoman Empire. And also, he mentions, also the eighth. This is John writing, also the eighth and is of the seventh. So whatever is the seventh that is going to come back as the eighth, that is the point I'm trying to highlight here. This is John writing, also the eighth and is of the seventh. So whatever you see in the seventh, which is we know what that is, that is the Ottoman Empire, and that is going to come back. You can read that in Revelation chapter 17, verse 11. This is very important for us to understand. So the five have fallen, five kingdoms and Rome, that is the current one for John, and then one had to come, that is the Ottoman Empire, and finally the Antichrist Empire, although it is eighth, but he says, and is of the seventh. So to, just to give you a brief uh, background, the Ottoman Empire, created by Turks, uh, Turkish tribes in Anatolia, the Asia Minor, uh, modern day Turkey, if you will, that grew to be one of the most powerful states in the world during the 15th and 16th centuries. Remember this, the Ottoman period spanned more than 600 years and came to an end only in 1922 when it was replaced by the Turkish Republic and various successor states in southeastern Europe and the Middle East. So after Rome, clearly we know the Ottoman Empire and that period spanned 600 years. And here in Revelation 13 verse 3, And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world marveled and followed the beast. So there are two ways this can be applied. In one way, as we saw, the head also represents a kingdom and also it represents a king. In when you talk about a kingdom, when you talk about the Ottoman Empire, it was wounded, but it is going to come back. And also, if you look at a king, this particular person, the Antichrist, he is going to be wounded, but he is going to survive. So we are going to see that. So that is what the Bible says. And I'm going to explain that in detail when I get to that passage. So, but in verse 3, it says, One of his heads, as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world marveled and followed the beast. So, when the Caliphate, when the Islamic Empire, when the Ottoman Empire, revived Ottoman Empire, comes back, the seventh uh, empire, which is also the eighth, the whole world marveled and followed the beast. Also, you need to remember, this happens when? This happens after the rapture, after the true Christians are all raptured. So now the people left behind will blindly follow this uh, Antichrist. And that is what it is talking about here. And also, when we talk about all this uh, 10 kingdoms, 10 horns and all that, always our focus need to be around Israel. I mentioned this several times. You cannot take out your focus away from Israel because everything is centered around Israel and a lot of activity is going to happen around this circle. Even the ten kingdoms that we talk about, everything happens in this circle. And in the previous sessions, even in my Daniel uh, study, the series which I did on Daniel, I explained this in greater detail. And 
the question was i was struggling with okay if i say the Brit the ottoman empire followed the roman but what happened to british empire somebody could ask me what about the british empire british also did you know they were ruling for a long time and occupying several places so i was struggling how can i call, uh, relate this if i put british also then this becomes the other empire right so how do we actually do this so then when i was looking at the map you can also look at this map and tell me this is talking about canada australia you know india and all these places but look at the mediterranean sea remember our focus is on the mediterranean sea so british empire was not coded here around the mediterranean sea except one country as i see it that is egypt but most of the activity for the british empire is not around the mediterranean sea that is the reason why john is not writing about the british empire but he is writing about the ottoman empire this is a very important point because if we keep listing the empires why are we skipping the british empire because it is not always our focus is on the mediterranean sea and around israel and now look at this map so this is all the activity of the ottoman empire around the mediterranean sea so you see uh, iraq baghdad damascus jerusalem cairo in all these places mentioned all the activity all you know, around the mediterranean sea so that is the reason i showed you the previous map about rome and that followed the, the ottoman empire around the same map again mediterranean sea now they are controlling this so that is the reason we put ottoman empire as the seventh one but not the british empire because british has nothing to do with around the mediterranean sea especially when we look at in the map of course they focused on the united states or canada australia and all other things but not around the mediterranean sea ottoman turks were controlling this uh, empire around this time so this is the map you can uh, look at the ottoman empire how they controlled that and of course this um, in revelation 13:9 if anyone has an ear let him hear this is a very familiar verse we studied several times when we were studying chapter 2 and chapter 3 for every church that when jesus writes a letter sends a letter to them and says at the end if anyone has here let him hear what the spirit says to the churches remember that but when we get to the middle of this book when we get to the chapter 13 the same message is the same message is now changed here what is missing the spirit says to the churches is missing because there is no church in this during this time very remarkable several times in chapter 2 and 3 it says if anyone has an ear let him hear what the spirit says to the churches this is what it was saying in revelation 2:7 2:11 2:17 2:29 3:6 3:13 3, and 3:22 it says the spirit says to the churches but that is missing now very clear indication that the church is not there and this message is, is not for the church so it's very remarkable even to have that kind of a detail uh, mentioned there and now the beast from the earth so last week we studied the beast from the sea the antichrist is a gentile coming from the sea symbol of the nations and the beast of the earth, from the earth land typically the false prophet is going to be a jew this is again a um, lot of scholars debate whether he is a jew or whether he is a gentile we don't know um, but based on what we are looking at the context here because he is coming from a land that's one clue he is the false prophet is going to be a jew coming from the earth a symbol of israel so one the antichrist is a gentile coming from the sea the symbol of the nations and the false prophet the beast from the earth from from the land the false prophet is going to be a jew coming from the earth symbol of israel and here we see then i saw another beast coming up out of the earth and he has two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon again i mentioned this as uh, the word another in greek it is allos um in greek they have when we say another in english that means it's just another for us but in greek there are two meanings here one is allos or the other one is heteros When you say allos it is of the same kind i want another of the same kind but when you talk about a heteros another of the different kind but here john is using the word allos meaning it is similar to the first beast that's what he is trying to say then i saw another beast allos coming up out of the earth and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon 
we see the deception of this beast right away what is the deception he, it looks like a lamb you know when you look at a lamb you know jesus was introduced as what we are going to see that verse also the lamb of god in john chapter 1 verse 29 it says the next day john that's john the baptist saw jesus coming towards him and said behold the lamb of god who takes away the sin of the world now here when we get to the uh, antichrist and the false prophet the false prophet is coming as a lamb and here even we were told in matthew chapter 7 in 15 verse 15 it says beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly they are ravenous wolves so that is exactly that is precisely what this false prophet is doing so he comes as a lamb but he speaks like a dragon it says so he is basically coming to the people as a false messiah so the second beast looks like a lamb and is thus most deceptive in appearance nobody is afraid of a lamb a lamb is a gentle harmless innocent and in scripture ceremonially clean when the false prophet appears he will at first seem to be all these things nobody will be frightened of him for like a lamb he will seem to be meek and lowly and will therefore be grossly underrated by mankind but that is part of satan's plan so that is how the false prophet is going to come on the scene he is going to come as a gentle innocent lamb and i think that is one of the reasons the Jew- jewish people will trust this guy and this guy will point to the antichrist and they will make a peace uh, a treaty with uh, uh, israel so that is why jesus also said i came in my father's name and you did not receive me but the other will come in his own name you are going to receive so the there the jewish people is going to receive this false prophet because he comes like a lamb he you know introduces him like a lamb gentle harmless innocent but then later they will realize he is going to talk like a dragon and now in verse 12 and he exercises all the authority of the first beast so this false prophet has the all the authority of the first beast that we talked about the antichrist last week so this this false prophet also have all the authority but what is he going to do he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed so this false prophet is coming on the scene as an innocent lamb but he is going to make everybody worship the first beast that is the antichrist and uh, whose deadly wound was healed in verse 13 he performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on uh, on the earth in the sight of men people will really fall for this you know even now when people run after instead of running for jesus christ some of them are run, run after miracles when they see a miracle they will just just give up everything so this guy is going to perform some miracles great signs bring fire from heaven and all that and then people say yeah this must be christ and that is how he is going to deceive he was given the power to do that and that is what he is going to do in verse 13 it says he performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men he is going to really perform lot of miracles so you may wonder how where does he get the power power you remember when moses started doing some uh, miracles and uh, you know the far pharaoh's court there were some magicians they were doing some tricks they were also performing they have the power of satan so this is empowered by satan here and this false christ prophet is going to perform great signs and wonders even makes fire come down from heaven interestingly the talking about the wounding and healing so there is a verse in zechariah chapter 11 verse 15 and 16 it says and the lord said to me next take for yourself the implements of a foolish shepherd when we study about all these uh, uh, prophets they just come on the scene and they act how god wants uh, them to convey the message sometimes it's like shaving their head sometimes like going and marrying a prostitute because god is telling a message to them and that is what the first first part says next take for yourself the implements of a foolish shepherd for indeed i will raise up a shepherd you can call that as a leader in the land who will not care for those who are cut off nor seek the young nor heal those that are broken nor feed those that still stand just think about a shepherd 
when the sheep is not moving he will take care of the sheep when the sheep is young he is going to take care of that sheep if there is if the sheep is having a broken bone or something he is going to uh, attend to that but here this shepherd verse 16 for indeed i will raise a shep- raise up a shepherd a leader in the land who will not care for those who are cut off nor seek the young nor heal those that are broken nor feed those that are still stand this false shepherd in your some of your translations call um foolish shepherd some of your translations call idol shepherd i d o l shepherd but he will eat the flesh of the fat and tear their hooves in pieces so he is not going to care about the people verse 17 or to the worthless shepherd the same idol shepherd we talked about or to the worthless shepherd who leaves the flock a sword shall be against his arm and against his right eye so where are these two things coming so one on his arm and the other um on his right eye his arm shall completely wither and his right eye shall be totally blinded so this is the thing that we i mentioned earlier so he, he will have a wound that get healed and he is going to perform as if he was dead and he came to or he re- rose again again he is trying to do what jesus christ did so he is actually trying to show the world that he has risen from the dead so all kinds of things that he is trying to uh, show to the world and that is what this even zechariah uh, prophesies in his uh, book zechariah chapter 11 15 and 17 talking about this idol shepherd which is also a false prophet in revelation 13 14 it says and he deceives this false shepherd or the false prophet and he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived so here we see he is now deceiving the people and he is telling the people to make an image to and to worship them and now next verse in 15 he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed we don't know what kind of miracles he is going to do so at least some of them were mentioned like he is going to bring fire from heaven and things like that and people will marvel because now you have televisions showing up all these things and the whole world will be in awe and they started following this beast the antichrist and the false prophet and also he is making everybody to worship the beast you remember why when we started the book of revelation the first chapter i told you why john was in patmos the island patmos because he did not worship the the put an incense to the emperor um, he did not worship the emperor that is the reason why he was exiled to the island patmos so they were forced to worship the emperor christians were killed or martyred because they refused to worship the emperor and now we are going to see that same thing come back here now they are going to force the people to worship the emperor the image of the emperor or the image of the antichrist he was granted power to give the breath to the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed so he is going to do some miracles that the images will speak we don't know what that is maybe some kind of a technology thing or maybe even really something is going to do but there is power given to this antichrist and the false prophet to do all kinds of tricks and miracles uh, to deceive the world but that's the reason why we were given this scriptures for us to understand what kind of a deception is going to come upon this world and revelation 19 this is way far back to the book end of the book so i'm just pulling some verses to connect the dots here Revelation 19 verses 19 and 20 it says and i saw the beast the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army so this beast and the false prophet and the antichrist they are all trying to fight against jesus christ and verse 20 then the beast was captured and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence by which he deceived remember underline that word deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshiped his image clearly there are two things going on here so the antichrist and the false prophet their main job is to deceive the world and how are they going to deceive if the if the people put faith in jesus christ and if they refuse to worship this um, uh, evil uh, duet uh, antichrist and the false prophet they will be killed they will be martyred but even if they are killed and martyred they will go to heaven because they are the tribulation saints we talked about 
but if they if they take the mark of the beast that is forever they are going to forfeit any entry into heaven so verse 20 then the beast was captured and with him the false prophet so the antichrist and the false prophet uh, who worked the signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshiped his image so clearly this says that they are going to give a mark some kind of a thing we are going to study that today so they are going to do that only when you worship the beast if you do not worship the beast you won't get the mark you can't do anything so you can't sell you can't buy you can't do anything so so basically what i'm trying to show you is this antichrist and the false prophet are here there to deceive the people to receive the mark of the beast so if they once a person receives the mark of the beast forever they are forfeiting their uh, uh, entry into heaven because they are denying jesus christ and worshiping this false christ and the antichrist so that's the reason why jesus also said here in matthew chapter 24 and jesus answered and said to them take heed that no one deceives you see when they were talking about the end times jesus clearly made this point in matthew 24 verse 4 and 5 says take heed that no one deceives you for many will come in my name saying i am the christ and will deceive many so it is remarkable how jesus could tell everything what is going to happen in the future So that is why here he says take heed that no one deceives you. And again in Matthew 24 verses 23 and 25 it says then if anyone says to you look here is Christ or there do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive if possible even the elect. See I have told you beforehand. Even he is making that point see I have told you beforehand because it is going to be the deception is all time high even now. when you turn on your tv you are so much deceived the things that come out they are trying to deceive you by telling what they want you to hear sometimes it's utterly false you know that but yet and by the time you get to this point in this tribulation it will be all time uh, all high deception so that is why jesus says then if anyone says to you look here is christ or there do not believe because they want you to draw out and they want you to kill so don't go out so if you are in a safe place away from this antichrist if they tell you that here is christ and there is christ don't go out that's what the message is for those people especially those who flee from the antichrist and protecting themselves in some place and verse 24 for false christs and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders to deceive if possible even the elect see i have told you beforehand so don't be deceived that's the message jesus is saying okay revelation 13 16 to 17 he causes all both small and great rich and poor free and slave to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name if you read these verses a few years ago people may wonder uh, how are they going to implement this how can do that now you you if you are watching tv and following the news what's going on they are forcing you to take this vaccine i'm not saying vaccine is the mark of the beast what i'm saying is there is the all the things that they are trying to implement is already available now they are forcing if you don't take the vaccine you will be fired from your job if you don't take this vaccine you, if you don't put a mask you will be sent at home you know all kinds of things are they are forcing on you a lot of things are going on right now again i am not saying vaccine is a mark of the beast i am not saying any of that what i am saying is this is all the the things that need for them to implement are already at play and probably this is a dry run this is a testing thing that is going on for you know so all the things are happening in front of our eyes So here the same thing is going to happen. So what is he going to do? He causes all both small and great rich and poor everybody free and slave to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark of the name of the beast or the number of his name. So here clearly it says you need to have the mark of the beast. So let's say if somebody understood everything that this is all the deception going on and they don't want to receive the mark how are they going to survive they cannot even buy food if you go to a grocery store you cannot buy food without this mark without showing a proof that you worshiped the beast so i'm going to explain what this mark is but 
they will ask for you that you worship the beast or what is your mark do you have a mark on your uh, right hand or your forehead otherwise you can't buy you can't sell this is going to be really hard and most of the people will be killed pretty much all of them will be killed because you can't buy food you can't do anything and uh, that is what uh, john is saying here so and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name so if you don't get the mark of the beast you can't do anything just like if you don't get vaccinated you can't fly or something like that what is happening right now these days pretty much they are going to enforce in strict order and in that case in during the time of antichrist they will kill you if you don't get the mark the mark actually the greek word is kerygma uh, um, there are a lot of translations for this in the I, these are the definitions from the dictionary from the greek a scratch or an etching it could be something a tattoo a stamp one other thing of the definition of a kerygma is as a badge of servitude this is very important as we are studying the other parts of this uh, passage a badge of servitude always a badge can be a paper or it could be on a uh, cloth or something it's a badge that you uh, tie to your arm or to your forehead to tell okay i follow these instructions or they will specially give you this badge or whatever it may be or it could be a mark some kind of a tattoo or some ink we don't know but these are all the possibilities i'm telling you so whatever it is you have to prove uh, just like people are asking for your proof of vaccination so you have to prove that you have got this mark of the beast that means you worship the beast so then you will be able to do other transactions otherwise you cannot that's what it means so here i'm talking about a tattoo bible talks about a tattoo also in leviticus 19:28 it says you shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead or nor tattoo any marks on you i am the lord so jesus gave a clear instruction to the israelites because they were following some heathen practices around that time cutting their bodies and putting some tattoos and you know for the dead and things like that and god says in leviticus 19 it says you shall not do like the other people the gentiles do so you shall not cu- make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead nor tattoo uh, any marks on you i am the lord so this is what bible talks about the tattoos and uh, now let's get to the other verse and the last word the verse 18 revelation 13 18 this is one of the verse probably everybody knows here is the wisdom let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast for it is the number of a man it is the number of a man his number in greek it is arthmos in it also means a definite number or an indefinite number as a multitude if you talk it as a multitude of people so how many people were there in an event a multitude you know so that is the idea here and his multitude is 666 so that is what it is so now the million dollar question for us is what is this 666 that is what we are going to look at so always remember from the beginning what is john doing john whatever you see you write it so john was seeing something the visions even the beast that coming out of the sea and all this whatever john says is writing he is also writing this number or whatever he is writing this particular chapter whatever he says he is writing keep that in mind so john sees something and he is writing 666 it uh, you know the uh, the chi and psi and the stigma so 666 that's greek letters these are greek letters so look at those greek letters it one is like an in you know, a cross words like an x and then the other one is like a wiggly character and then you see that uh, stigma there six these three are greek character the greek numbers numerals and another point for you to remember here is in greek you don't have the numbers separately you know so like we have in alphabets and numbers you know if you want to write a number you use the same uh, alphabets to represents the numbers in greek so the point here now let's look at some use uh, gametria that means you as i said they have they have these alphabets and also it is used as a number so they use this gametria assigning a number value to each letter of a name or a word and then combining the numbers to arrive to a total number so having identified the antichrist as various people in the world history some of the popular targets have been caesar and nero 
So if you put this gametria, that means uh, take these words and put those numbers together and then you add it up, you get to 666. So some people did this gametria tricks and then they came up with uh, Caesar Nero. And if you look at Ronald Wilson Reagan, each word has six characters. So if your name has six characters and if your middle name also has six characters, probably you're an antichrist. <laughs> That's what it is they're talking about here. So Ronald, six characters, Wilson, six characters, and Reagan, six characters. So that is how they, they said, oh, Ronald Reagan must be uh, an antichrist. And some other form of uh, uh, gametria is you assign a value to an uh, alphabet and then you add it up. For example, for alphabet A, let's say 10 or 100, whatever, and then you just keep add all those things together and then come at 666. So that is what people will try to do and always came up with all kinds of things. And various and so they gave, came up with various popes and Roman Catholics and all kinds of things. So the lengths some will go to in order to get a person's name to add up to 66 are amazing. So that means they will try all kinds of things to make a person look like an antichrist or make it you know, his name come to a 666. Virtually any name can add up to 666 if enough mathematical gymnastics are employed. Do you see that? If you try to just uh, try to do mathematical gymnastics, so you can just make any person's name as 666. So the point I'm trying to mention is you, the, the libraries, the bookstores are full of books with this with gametria, this must be antichrist, that must be. So don't fall for that because there is no reason for us to look at the gametria because that's not the idea and it was not used anywhere in the Bible. So the 666, just assigning it to have. And, and another thing is, these people, when they do all this, Ronald Wilson, Reagan and things like that, they are using English alphabet. They are not even using Greek. They are not even using Hebrew or anything. So how can you put some kind of some other language and then put some values and try to come up with uh, numbers. So please don't waste your time with all this uh, uh, adding numbers and uh, mathematical gymnastics. So this is what actually it looks like as uh, Codex Vaticanus in AD uh, 350 uh, shows. John saw what he wrote. So you have to keep that always in mind before we understand and th this thing better. John saw these three um, characters or symbols, better to call it as a symbol. So he saw something and he wrote that. And also underline, uh, see the middle character, that wiggly character there in the middle. Um, and it has a top, there is a line. And uh, look at that line, it is also having a hook at the end. It is not just a line. And if you look at uh, a Greek character, uh, chi or z, so that doesn't have a line at the top. You just don't have a line. But when you look at what actually John saw, it has this line on the top. It is also having a hook and in a particular direction. And then you have this X, kind of an X thing showing like a two swords uh, on that symbol. So again, when John saw this, he wrote it. But later when people started looking at his um, autographs or the, uh, the manuscripts, they immediately realized these symbols somewhere looks like uh, Greek characters. So let's assign some values. So let's put, you know, 666. And after that point, every translation, English or any language, they started using 666. Do you know how we got that 666? So somebody looked at these, uh, these uh, symbols and they thought, okay, this must be these Greek uh, alphabets are because you see at the bottom of my screen there, I showed you it is, is resembling, um, but of course I put that in the different order here. So 660 and 600. So if you look at the other side, they closely resemble these uh, Greek numbers, numerals. And that's what, and they started translating saying 666. So now if you open any English Bible, that's what it says. But they don't talk about these symbols. But in the original Codex Vaticanus, the actually it, the, what you see is these symbols. So when you look at this Allah in Arabic calligraphy, so this is what it is. If you take this and show it to somebody to read it, they will say Allah. So that is what it means. So this is the middle, so if John saw three symbols and look at the middle symbol with a line at the top and also a hook at the top for that line, this exactly is what John saw. But of course it is tilted in a different position, but that is what John saw. 
and how close he is with that right so look at that and look at that hook at the top so the middle character what you are seeing here is the uh, arabic word al a and uh, if you look at the saudi arabia or any other flags that you look uh, look at there are the two swords always the symbolizes the islamic uh, uh, Islamic uh, nation or uh, Islam, basically those two swords represents Islam. So those two symbol, the swords, exactly what John saw. If you go back to that uh, first character, what you are first symbol you are seeing, those exactly looks like those two swords. And of course, the middle one I already explained. And then I'm going to show you about the first one as well. So here is the Shahada. Shahada is what basically it is uh, the islamic confession of faith it's worn on the foreheads and arms of muslims it states there is no god but allah and muhammad is his messenger of allah and in that shahada so here look at uh, revelation 13 18 it says this calls for a wisdom let the one who has understanding uh, calculate the number of the beast for it is the number of a man and his number is 666. So here in this Shahada, as you look at it, the middle portion, you see those three symbols, what John saw. And what it says is, the whole message is, there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. So when we look at only those three characters together, that is 600, which represents the swords, Kai, and then you saw the 60, that is Z, that uh, we, sh we already talked about Allah. And what about the stigma? So that is the character it says, in the name of. What it means is, if you write that Arabic letter and mm, ask someone to read it, it says, uh, in the name of. So in the name of Allah, and then it says, the uh, Islamic, the symbols of this cross swords. The, those are the three symbols. So in the name of Allah and then the uh, cross swords. It is very interesting and this is th what they uh, wore on their foreheads. Or So the Bismillah with swords. So if you read those three characters in the name of Allah and then you have that uh, swords representing that uh, uh, Kai. Hope this makes sense. So this again, I am just trying to see, explain what John saw. John saw symbols. If you look at those symbols, and what those symbols represents. That's why John is also saying you need to have wisdom to understand this. These are Arabic symbols and uh, and uh, you can clearly see what it means. And here is, you can see in this picture, this person having a headband and in the middle of that highlighted, what do you see? Just those three symbols what John saw. Just those three symbols what John saw. Well, you can see that. And th this is not just, you know, uh, uh, one or two people doing it. it you, you see this all over. So, of course, they have now different kinds of headbands and things like that. But the point is, this is what the Antichrist is going to make you do it. So, either it is a tattoo or a headband like this. Uh, but whatever it is, you need to worship. And then you will be receiving uh, some kind of a headband or a some kind of a karigma that is some kind of a tattoo i don't know so but i'm just trying to explain what john saw john saw three symbols and those three symbols again let me point out those three symbols are there in their headband exactly what john saw so it is so remarkable how those three things come together of course you may say oh those are in different direction but as you know alphabet sometimes even we write different order or different uh, uh, tilting or you know slant or whatever but the remarkable thing is all those three characters what john saw are here and again another picture showing the headband um, some you know so the, some of them are wearing that on the foreheads and some I don't have a picture. Some of them wear it on the right hand um, uh, when they go to wars or when they fight wars. So they do that. So here again, you see even a little kid having that headband of uh, some kind. So let me conclude about these symbols. The 666, what does 666 represents? So although our English Bible says 666, as I said, that was a translation that they looked at these symbols and they tried to equate that to as a geometry, as I said, oh, this must be this number, this must be this number, this must be this number. 
but what if if john only saw those uh, uh, symbols and he just wrote it what he saw and again if he is writing 666 he would not write that line at the top with a hook on it so keep that in mind so he would not write that line at the top for the middle character with a hook on it so he would not write if it is a 666 that's what my point is he just wrote the symbols what it means and now we have those exact symbols represented in the headbands in uh, islamic uh, nations we saw that so now with that we with that we are clear about what that 666 means so my point is if you are left behind or if you are during the tribulation period and if you happen to watch a video something like this don't get the mark of the beast that's the important if you get the mark of the beast that means you are going to forfeit any entry into heaven so you are forever going to go to hell that's what clearly it says the bible says so even if you are ready to, if you if they are, if they kill you that's fine but you know don't get the mark of the beast that's the message that jesus is telling us in the book of revelation and that is why satan and his um uh, uh, the false prophet and antichrist they are trying to get everyone to get this mark of the beast deceiving the people so that's why jesus said don't be deceived okay with all that said now let's look at another verse and then we'll conclude this session matthew chapter 24 29 it says immediately after the tribulation of those days so the tribulation period is for how long 7 years and uh, the, the last uh, the last half that is 3 and 1/2 years is called the great tribulation lot of things happen all this persecution all these things will happen in the second part because first when these two characters these two beasts come on the scene they they show themselves as good guys deceiving people but their true colors will come out at the middle of that when they go to this temple and declare themselves as god and force everybody to worship them So now uh, verse 29 immediately after the tribulation of those days the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light the stars will fall from the heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken then the sign of the son of man will appear in heaven and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the son of man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory and he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the heaven to the other at the end of the seven year tribulation we are going to study in chapter 19 how satan will be cast into the lake of fire how the the antichrist and the beast the false prophet will be thrown into the lake of fire and when all that has taken place then you see the son of man coming this christ appearing in the heaven and he is going to rule for a thousand years and then of course we are going to get into the eternity for in the after the millennium so all that going we are going to study in the future sessions but here my point is are you ready if the rapture happens tonight are you ready have you given your life to jesus christ i know you may be interested in studying the book of revelation and trying to understand 666 and antichrist and all that but our focus need to be on the on jesus christ more than the antichrist of course since these details are given in the bible and we are trying to understand but our focus need to be on jesus christ have you submitted your life to jesus christ have you asked his forgiveness if not maybe tonight is the time that you could go and ask him for forgiveness because i don't want you to be left behind i don't want your loved ones to be left behind it is the tribulation is not a joke and you don't want to gamble with your eternity so submit yourself to god confess your sins and ask for his forgiveness 1 John 1:9 it says if you confess your sins he is faithful that is Jesus Christ is faithful and just to forgive your sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness no matter what your sin is sometimes people say oh i have sinned so badly you know so nobody is going to forgive me no whatever that sin may be Jesus Christ says if you confess your sins he is faithful and just to forgive your sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness don't worry about the mark of the beast don't worry about all these things because these will not apply to the christians those who have put faith in jesus christ because we are told we will be raptured before all this happens so thank you for watching and uh, we will continue this revelation series and if you have not subscribed to these videos please do subscribe and if you like these videos please give a like that will help others to also follow and watch these videos and here is the channel and also i have a blog mydailydevotion.org again thank you for watching